Welcome to the Team EF Coaching Performance Podcast, where we take information from the highest level of sport and make it accessible for all cyclists. I'm your host, Zach Morris, and today I'm sitting down with Daniel Holloway, who is an ex-professional road and track cyclist, whose achievements in racing account for five U.S. National Criterium Championships, two Elite Road Race Championship titles, he's a 14-time national track champion, and the 2019 Pan American Games champion. We're excited to welcome Daniel as a team member of the EF Coaching roster of coaches. I know that he will be a great resource for anyone looking to improve not only their fitness, but also their strategy in racing. Daniel Holloway, welcome to the Team EF Coaching Performance Podcast. Thanks. I'm super excited to to join the team and you know, get back with Colby Pierce, you know, my kind of from day one mentor. So it's full circle, right? It's, it ends up being a very small world. And so I'm excited to be back. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with uh, Colby, because obviously Colby plays a big part in all the things that we do on, on the coaching side. And I'd love to know a little bit more about uh, how you two know each other and, and, and all of that. Yeah. I mean, Colby, when I was a junior, like Kobe was the man, like he was the guy, you know, there was a couple of them, right. But Kobe was, you know, one of the premier track riders in, in the U S and, you know, in the world, he was, you know, really doing well in the world cups and all that stuff. So he was a guy that was just ever present when I started coming up on the track. And one of my first national championships, I was riding with, um, another pro Dave McCook and Kobe was there and we had my, we had some equipment that Kobe wanted to test just some unique Japanese wheels, um, Araya and Colby being the, the equipment dork he was my dad being the equipment dork and me soon to follow. Um, Colby ended up borrowing, you know, the Araya to go to the Olympics. And so when we saw him at that next national championships, he was super thankful. And then just gave me like a grab bag of like, you know, all these just cool Oakley's. Um, and just ever since that, that moment, like it was just, we were always just, whenever we saw each other hanging out, et cetera. And, you know, he was kind of the guy to go to for mentorship and asking questions and what's the next, this, what's the next, that, you know, how do I get here? How do I get there? Um, and yes, he just took me under his wing as, as soon as I kind of like took that next step in ability, um, maturity, you know, being able to handle, you know, the pressure. So he kind of took me under the wing when I got onto the, the Garmin U23 program and was like, you know, you're my guy, we're going to go to the six days. We're going to race the track. Um, let's do that. And so we just, you know, at a young age, have him take me around the world. <laughs> Not much has changed. He's still the guy yep. everybody yep. goes to when they've got problems <laughs> to solve, except now yep. it's like, uh, it's guys like me, masters riders who have a sore back. <laughs> like, ah, yep. dude, my, my hips hurt me. Call me. What should <laughs> I do? <laughs> yeah. Is he making bombs yet? Is he sending out concoctions? Has he gotten that level yet? I mean, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if Colby came out with some foot cream or like <laughs> some, 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 something of that nature. That wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, I think it's coming. My gut, yeah. my gut's telling me that, that, that a, a Colby balm of some sort is coming. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> All right, Daniel, it was difficult to do that introduction without running out of breath. The list of your race results is a long one. But before we get into unpacking some of your secrets to Criterium Racing, I wanted to ask you. If you had to pick one of those races as the most meaningful to you, which would it be and why? I mean, that's such a a tricky question. And I think there's always kind of a pinnacle race. But when I look and I hear those, that list of results, a a theme that comes to mind is each one of those had different, had adversity in some kind, right? Just some kind of massive hurdle in front of me that I had to face and just, and just deal with when I won my first elite amateur crit, my dad was there. It was like a super special moment. But the week before I came back from Europe with the flu and I didn't ride for five days leading into that race weekend. And so there was a massive sense of unknown, right? In this ultimate, you know, week of like, oh, this is like the worst preparation. How could I ever, I'm at nationals and I'm going to do the worst ever. Like This is just a waste of time and money, but I end up winning, right? But it's just, so it's just at a young age, here's a hurdle just follow your process and do your best race. When I won my gold medal at the Pan Am games, there was a lot of just kind of 
personal and also like behind doors political stuff that was going on. And so mm -hmm. it was just days and days and days of just kind of not having ideal mental lead up, right? But in the game, getting myself into the game and into the moment to to be successful. And so each of those those races, I'm proud of being able to come over overcome adverse moments, right? Not having the perfect lead up to any one of those to have the perfect outcome. And so just kind of as a collective, being able to see a mountain, make a plan and, and climb to the top of it is what I'm most, most proud of. That's great. I think one of the things I always say to people, right, is like quitting is always the easy way. Not taking the start line is the easy way out. It takes so much courage to like just get on the start line. And when you're a competitor, like I raced against you, you're a real competitor, competitive guy. And <laughs> you know, when, 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 when a competitor sees another competitor, there's always that standard line of respect. They're like, all right, real recognize real. This person's in it to win it. And that side of you, if that exists inside of you, it will always come out so long as you take the start line. But if you don't yep. take the start line, you've got no chance. So I actually love that answer. That answer is, it's deep and not as superficial as, you know, just picking one race, but I, I, I appreciate it. So let's get into breaking down some criterium racing step by step. One of the things about criterium racing is that big races take place all over the country. This means that all the courses, climates and race conditions are different. In your opinion, where should we start to shape our perspective around upcoming events? And what are the key things that we should consider when thinking about participating in upcoming races? I guess the first, the first step is identifying who you are as a rider and what your strengths and your weaknesses are, right? It's like, I'm a sprinter, right? That's, that's my strength. Weakness going uphill, moderate is that time trial, steady, steady state work. So then when I go to, or I look at a crit course, say I'm going to Tulsa Tough, and there's three days of racing. Day one, this core shape is going to have this style of racing. We can expect this type of outcome based on 10 years of races there. We go to day two, it's this core shape has this feature. We can look at the history of it and pick out what it's likely going to end up being. Then we have Crybaby Hill. That one is like a grab bag of like, could be anything. It has a hill in it, has wind, has heat. And so that's the first step to any crit is identifying yourself and your strengths and your weaknesses, and then breaking down a course and how that course suits or doesn't suit you. And then develop your game day strategy onto maximizing your strengths and not exposing your weaknesses as, as much as possible. And so those are my like key foundations. And when you say, you know, look at the race history, would you recommend that athletes go and look at results in the category that they're competing in and seeing if the races blew apart, if they were bunch sprints or uh, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, totally. Because a cat three race on one course is not going to end or necessarily play out the same as the, the pro race, just because of the level, the depth of a cat three race may not be the same, is not going to be the same as a pro race, right? So you could have really five to 10 strong cat three guys, and then it falls off pretty quick to the rest of the field. And so those five, 10 guys could easily just ride away on crybaby Hill and it ends up in a breakaway in a small group sprint for that race. But because the depth of the field in the men's pro race is so deep, it's going to be more of a, a war of attrition, right? And you're going to get to that finish in a different style. So you definitely kind of have to look at your category that you're racing and what kind of that race history is you can't just dictate it on, you know, what the pro men and pro women are doing. So how as you start to build strategy around what you'll do during a race? Yes, it's, it's twofold. It's like, am I showing up to the race as an individual? You know, there was a couple of years where I was, you know, mostly by myself or there was, you know, plenty of times where I raced on a team. And so if you're racing by yourself, you have to develop a strategy that's going to best suit you and also understand and try to figure out what the other teams or the, the bigger teams in your category in your race are likely going to do. You know, if I'm showing up to a race nowadays and I'm racing Legion and ACG and Miami Blazers, you know, the, the current field on a four corner square crit, 
pretty much guaranteed that, you know, Legion is going to take control of the race and it's going to be a waste of energy to try to attack or make it a really hard race because they just have the depth to ride a high tempo to bring it to a field sprint. We go to a technical course, eight corners, where there's a lot of ease of gap, a lot of change of pace that's going to wear a, a team down. Now your chances go up for a breakaway. So those are the two, what I'm looking for. Um, as a, If I go at two races, an individual, if I'm going with a team, how do I now use my teammates or the team as a whole to create a strategy that's going to push the race into our favor and our strength? And it may be we have six time trial, just strong guys. So we don't want to wait around for a field sprint. So that means from lap one, we've got to go really hard and just keep the race full gas and hope that a couple things fall our ways for gaps to open, people be misplaced, and for us to have the numbers in a breakaway to then keep making the race hard and just be at the front at the end. You know, it sounds simple and a little um, easy, so to speak, but if that's the kind of team your makeup is, that's what you, your strategy is. If you just have one sprinter and a bunch of guys that are strong, you want to keep the race in control. And some sprinters like a very punchy race, very on off, on off, and your team can create that race for you. But if you're a team that just likes one high pace, you need your team strategy is to create that just very high tempo. So it's you're just nice and calm. You don't have a lot of pace shift in your legs for that final sprint. So what about the the solo warrior who's trying to sniff out that breakaway on that technical course? What are you looking for when you get in the field and how do you how do you sniff out that breakaway? The the cliche statement is when you're suffering, everybody's suffering, and that's the moment to attack. And that comes back to kind of the full circle of when you, before you get to a race, you identify who and what you're capable of. And so if you're a guy that can withstand high tempo, high pace, you wait for that moment. You don't create that moment yourself. You wait kind of for the race to do it and other teams to make it like really hard and then wait for that moment to go, if I'm suffering and I feel like I'm pretty good, everybody else is in a very similar boat. I sh- all you need to do is just attack. And again, it sounds really simple, but it's just this mindset of all I need to do is do 10 extra pedal strokes harder to get that gap. And then it becomes a mindset race. You're no longer racing legs. You're, roast, you're, ra- you're racing the mind of somebody else. And the it, idea is it, to build your mind to be stronger than somebody else. That's so true. And, and, and I think what's funny is, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the style of attacks that typically work. I mean, we all love to watch you know, the Tour de France where everybody's in absolute peak conditioning and the race is won by a superstar attack with the camera in front of the rider going on a really cool part of the course. But in crit racing, a lot of the times it really is that battle of the mind where there are a series of accelerations and one rider just kind of rolls off to the side at a slightly higher pace. It's usually not a massive out of the saddle acceleration that looks really sweet. It's just a matter of somebody deciding that they're going to go a little bit harder and you know one or two guys will go with them and it'll form a little group and that a lot of times is the winning move and so it's just that that mental battle would you say i mean you've done so much racing right so i think you're the right person to ask you know when, when we're talking about criterium specifically would you, would you say that you've ever identified a common trend in knowing that it's going to be the winning move in a crit uh it's in sitting in this chair, I can say yes, but I can't identify the moment because it's everyone is so unique. It's being tuned in. It's racing those 60 days a year. Um, or for me, I was fortunate to race like 100 years a day or 100 days a year, racing six days and then jumping into early season crits and, and roll it out. So it's it's just building that like just fast neuro response time and reading everything super fast and just kind of knowing. And there were some races I was kind of able to force it, right? But you still have to w- wait for that moment, get the guy. Some of it is just getting the right guys in the right place. And some of that's like not even having the strongest guys in the breakaway, but it's having the right guys out of a team that they're happy to be there. And you know that team is going to spend a lot of energy blocking the field, slowing the field down because it's like they've made the move. This is like the best result they're going to get all year because they're an East Coast team, right? And mm-hmm. this is they're at iron hill and that's their mega race for the year and you put one of those guys in the breakaway with you so now i've just doubled my team size because i've got all those guys working for me in the back by just getting in the way and disrupting the pace and so it's just so case by case 
Right. But I think that strategy that you just laid out is even more effective in masters racing, for example, where there might only be like two teams in the race. And so if you (laughs) have one of the big teams with you, like that's a great strategy, you know, the racing at the pro level is so different because in, in pro racing, nobody ever gives up and the depth in the field is always there. So you've typically always got somebody who can come to the front and drive it for five to 700 Watts for a minute and close down a pretty big gap. Right. So those little nuggets that you just dropped about, you know, positioning yourself with the right people, it's like anything in life, you want to be surrounded (laughs) by good people. Right. Um, those are super effective strategies in the lower categories where the depth in the field isn't necessarily there. And, uh, the the races are generally controlled by, you know, one or two dominant teams. One of the other things too, that we, we, we maybe didn't touch on yet was the amount of skill that's required to race criteriums. You mentioned two kind of distinct types of criteriums, one where it was a four corner crit, and then another one where it was a more technical eight corner crit. And a lot of these times, these, these technical courses, they have uphills, downhills on top of the corners and maybe a change in, uh, you know, pavement surface and so on and so forth. So if you had to list out the most critical skills that an athlete would need to consistently perform well in criterium racing, what would be on that list? I think developing a level of comfort, a high level of comfort in a stressful or uncomfortable situation. I mean, for instance, like immediate references last week, local crit, I was in there and there was a guy just strangling his handlebars to death. I mean, (laughs) they... It, it just, he was, you could just, he was a, you know, a really cut dude. And you could just see every forearm muscle was fully activated. Every tricep, bicep, everything. He was just fully activated the whole race. And there was, the speed never changed. It was just very like 28, 30, 28, 30, 32. It just like very, and it, we're on like a closed core, smooth tarmac. And the guy just gripping his handlebars to death. And it's like, whoa. Dude, you just like lay your hands on your bars and you can steer, like just learn to steer with your weight. You know, you don't have to grip and be tense unless you're trying to do your max sprint. And so it's just practicing that, getting comfortable when you're in close tight. And if you plan on racing your bike, put yourself in positions where there's crowds, go on group rides, find a group of buddies that you guys, 10, 12 of you can always just ride together and build over time, being able to ride just like, you know, that you can barely pass a hand through vertically through your handlebars. You know, you could ride 10K and you guys could just be bar to bar or just touching knuckles while you're on the hood and just get level to that type of comfort. No, and then knowing that if you touch, it's not the end of the world, you know, that you don't have to have a massive reaction and, and build a scenario where everything in high stress moments truly becomes slow motion. Like when Colby and I would come back from racing six days and go race a criterium, everything was slow motion. The fastest crits in the nation, the tightest courses were nothing compared to 14 teams on a 200 meter track averaging 60K an hour doing hand slings. You know, so I, I got that experience, right? It's just high neural response and then come to America and it's just like wide open roads and it's just like nose breathing, you know, just... I could think about 30 other things other than this race where everybody else is white knuckling themselves. And I think that was a skill set that I was fortunate enough to develop and have access to that gave me the freedom to let my mom, mind think about race tactics, think about looking at other guys' pedal strokes and body language and all these other pieces that I used to read a race. You, you know, it's so funny that you... You put it together that way. I was in a, I was in a crit, um, this, this race called Marty Lachine. Have you ever done a Marty Lachine criterium, Daniel? No. So, so it's one of Canada's oldest criteriums. It's like 60 years old. And this guy named Tino Rossi has been putting it on ever since it's, it's kind of crazy because it's on every Tuesday night and there's hundreds of fans every Tuesday night at the local Tuesday oh, wow. nighter. They have leaders jersey, a bunch of prize money, like lights, scoreboards. It is a whole scene. When I was a, uh, when I was like nineteen, racing for a, a a Canadian pro team, they used to fly us down because it was like a seven hour drive. So he, he, Tino would fly us down, put us up in like the penthouse hotel just to race the crit on a Tuesday nighter. 
right? Like it was that big of a, of a spectacle. So I hadn't done this race for like 15 years, but I, I'd done it when I was, when I was young and I jump in this race and that same thing that you're just describing was happening to everybody. We averaged 49 K <laughs> an hour, right? Like, the, like the average speed was 49 K an hour. I tried to yep. go on the breakaway. I'm like, dude, I'm pulling at 500 Watts and not getting any gap at all. No breakaways going anywhere on this course. <laughs> We're flying. I'm going to cruise to the back and just surf through the corners. Right. So I was surfing through the corners and this guy starts yelling at me because I'm leaving a gap through the corners. And I'm saying to myself, like, dude, what, what do you, you think I'm going to get dropped from the race? <laughs> like, no, we're not getting, we're, like, no, dude, like, we're not going anywhere. We're just not sprinting out of every corner into the back of the other body so that we can slam on the brakes for the next corner. Like, we're just, we're, I'm not playing that game. Right. But, yep. you know, yep. what you just described in a, in a long winded way was making the conscious decision to think while you're racing and not just follow what everybody else is doing, you know, learning that perspective that it sounds like you gained in those, in those six days of, you know, thinking and building race strategy in these extremely, you know, high intensity situations is a skill that, I mean, there's no measuring how, how invaluable that is. Like that's, that, that's how you win races. Right. So is there anything else that you think is like a really critical component to being a good criterium rider? I think that's, that's truly the foundation is that if you can, you know, I learned it from racing the track as a junior and doing, I mean, and doing just tons of group rides, you know, like I was always, I never rode by myself. I was always surrounded by people and, you know, group rides in Northern California, uphill, downhill, right? So you learn, you start to learn that descending skill with faster and faster riders and being comfortable and letting, you know, definitely as a young rider, you know, finding the next fastest guy to follow, right? And then being young and a little fearless, <laughs> pushing your limits, you know, more than I would, you know, nowadays, especially if I just started riding again. Um, but I think it's just that foundation of surrounding yourself by people, avoid, you know, there are the days where you need to go ride by yourself and stay focused and stay in your intervals, but find ways to incorporate group rides and being around people um, more often than not for those race environments that it's not a, a new neural response that's going to have you um, shook or, you know, out of your thinking process. And I was a big believer in neuro fatigue and in the sense of like, if I could reduce it on myself, again, I was just much more calm, you know, five, five beats per minute. That's either 170 or 175. And we all know that that's like, that's huge. If you can be at 170 for a longer yeah. period than 175, you're going to be better off in 10 minutes, <laughs> you know, yeah. And vice versa, if I could use tactics or gamesmanship to get neural response to other riders, other teams, like throwing false attacks or, you know, what have you to get them, you know, stress spiked and get their neural response firing as soon as possible, knowing that they're going to be, their heart rates elevated sooner and it's, they just can't do it for an hour and know that going into like, okay, minute 40, they've, they've had an elevated heart rate because, because I know I've been playing games with them. And I've just been in the driver's seat, staying cool. That they're soon, they're going to break sooner than later. And so, yeah, just creating those moments for yourself. So when you get into a race day, you have all the chances to be as calm as possible. So we talked a little bit around building a strategy based on your strengths and potential weaknesses. So, how would you think about changing your plan mid race if things aren't working out? to what you had planned. What is the, what are some of the things to consider when making mid race strategic decisions? So you have plan A, right? And you never go into race with just plan A. Like you try to develop a plan B, plan C, et cetera, that if, if this, then that, if this, then that always, right? And that if a race goes on, that can go on the whole race. If this, then that, especially if things don't, don't go well and say a race just kind of gets out of control and there's 10 guys up the road and, and you've missed it. You do have to draw instead of like continue to panic or be frustrated that you made it, missed it. There was times where I just had to like go back 20 wheels and do a hard reset, like get myself out of the front and, you know, out of that mistake, if you will, and just calm myself down and rethink and reevaluate what all is happening in the moment. Okay. 
who actually is the 10 people up the road? What teams are they? Who actually is happy or who isn't happy? And, and have to then do the quickest possible thinking, right? And come up with a new plan as quick as possible. And just come up with a plan that I think is going to work and try to execute it. And relatively quickly, you're going to know if that's working or not working. And kind of, you got to keep doing that. And sometimes you can make that happen in a half lap and then two laps to execute and figure out if it's working or not working, right? And then, you know, it's kind of these forks in the road that you can get to points where you have to reevaluate and being flexible and have a malleable mind to let that process happen and not get so fixated with blinders that it's just like, we wanted a breakaway today and just be so fixated on that. And if it's just not happening, you have to allow yourself to try something different, right? Okay, we're going to have to do a field sprint, but we don't have a sprinter. What's our best thing? Well, let's just go long and make this the longest sprint and see where we end up. Because you may end up like fourth. It may just shatter behind you. A crash may happen. Somebody with bad legs may be like caught out in the wrong position and open gaps for you. You don't know. So if you if you just go for a breakaway and you're like 10 to go, there's no breakaway, it's over and your whole team just goes to the mid pack and say, it's never worked. That's like having like a, a non-malleable mind. It's like, let's try something different, right? Um, and so just being flexible. That's amazing advice. I, uh, I, I agree 100% with, uh, with, with those comments. And I, I think that the key take home there is like, try something. Right. Don't give yeah. up. Quitting is always easy. And yep. to your point, especially about maybe you're not a sprinter and just going long. That's a great point. Like I, I, I honestly, like you never know what's going to happen behind you, but if you're in it and you're giving it a shot, you've got a chance. If you quit, you've got no chance. So that's brilliant yep. advice. I, I, I love it. Let's talk a little bit more about preparation for these races. One of the big, you know, questions that we always get is based around nutrition so what does your nutrition typically look like on race day before the race or, and directly after the race, since, you know, you did a lot of multi-day criterium races. Yeah. And I think when I raced and like how much we've learned in, you know, probably the four years since I was doing the, like the last big crits and leading up to like my Olympic run, I think a lot of knowledge has been gained on that. It's front changed a lot. Are, yeah, I agree. Um, I implementing different strategies and, you know, there are some foundational cores, right, that we have, we have to follow, but also realize everybody's a little bit of a unique snowflake. <laughs> um, with, with Colby within Pierce those, right there. Yeah, within those lanes. Um, so it's just, I stayed on the, like, the kind of the core principles and then just experimented with what worked for me, both, like, physically, but also mentally. And understanding mm -hmm. that, you know, this is one thing I learned with Colby, for instance, is he was, you know, definitely early in our travels was, was fixed mind on the food he needed. And if he didn't right. get that food, he would start to kind of like deteriorate mentally and just be, get frustrated that, you know, his nutrition's not right. And I can't have this and oh, that's only this is available. At the time I was young and I could eat anything. It was like Taco Bell, McDonald's, fr like whatever, just feed me and I'm good. And yeah. it was a little bit foolish, right? As I'm trying to be like absolutely world-class, but I had the malleable mind that is like, if I'm full, I'll be fast you know, and figure it out. Um, and that kind of just stayed with me my, my whole career. Cause it's like, sometimes you're, you know, speed week, we're out kind of in the middle of Georgia or South Carolina. And there's just like, not much except for like a mom and pop diner, you know, and you finish at nine 30, 10, the only thing's a waffle house. It's like get in the waffle house and eat, you know, right. don't cover it in syrup, you know, don't cover it in ketchup, but you can have some simple carbs. You can have some protein, like you can have some eggs, boom. And that like you're, it's not the most wonderful thing, but I've got my bases covered in the sense right. of, you know, getting it going and, and getting fuel back into the system. Um, and then have a plan in the morning to be like, okay, where can I get some like fresh fruit and some of the nicer things to like put, put back in, um, you know, so it's just, again, it's, balance it out, ba balance it, balance, balance it out and just not go too crazy, you know? Um, and, and remembering that and I think, I would watch a big thing with crit racing, especially I, I would see a lot of guys fall into the trap of doing this one hour intense effort and then you get done with it and your metabolism is through the roof. You're just like, oh, I'm so hungry. And guys would just like sit down and have 2,500 calories. And it's like, yeah. whoa, whoa, dude, dude like we, we, it was only a thousand. 
you know, yeah. and as, as much as you feel, you know, like that was a 2,500 kJ effort, it was just a thousand. And we know like the metabolism tightened, so you're going to burn a little more like throughout the night. So it's like, you can go 12, 14, you know, depending on who you are, but I would see you guys just like overeat and then get to like June and they're like, I've put on weight and I'm like, yeah, dude, because you hammer yourself with food after every race. It's crazy. You know, so it's like, you do have to get the carbs, but it's like on the, you know, quote rest days, like you have the Caesar salad with chicken. Like you don't need the full burger on non-race day. <laughs> um, so just being conscious of like, you know, having that, you know, those types of things. Um, yeah. And then what, what, ultimate, what, go for it. No, I was going to say what really cracks me on the crit scene is, is how much beer the guys drink. Yeah. Like yeah. They, some of these guys <laughs> drink a lot of beers and they're great athletes and they, they can just, they can put them back. And I, I don't drink any alcohol at all. So for like, for me, that's like a, an extreme, but you know, there's a lot of calories also in beer as well. That's why you see a lot of these crit guys a bit thicker. <laughs> it's, it's also, if you touch down, you're a little safer, you know, that just, that was the excuse. <laughs> there is, it was a durability thing more than, um, more than anything else. Padding. Yeah. <laughs> what was it? Wasn't it like, um, gosh, what was that guy's name from crit life? Aldo. Aldo Ilisek, he yep. always said that crit racing should be done with uh, like shoulder pads and elbow pads. <laughs> yeah, there's oh a gosh. there's an alternate universe where they're doing bike races dressed as American gladiators, and it's probably getting a lot of views. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but kind of go back to the nutrition. What like about... My race day stuff was quite abnormal Absolutely. compared to a lot of people. Like, I was. Um, relatively slow metabolism and I had a high tolerance for caffeine. So, you know, I seem to operate pretty well on, you know, 30 to 40 ounces of Red Bull, depending on the, wow. the day, the lead up. Um, and yeah, one thing it took me a little to kind of figure out is like people have coffee, caffeine, you know, coffee and people have like two espressos and they like start to get a little jittery. I found that if you go past the jitters, you start getting into your therapeutic use dosage um and so and it it tested out on a couple of teammates where it's like they'd have like two red bulls like dude i'm like a little nervous I'm like, dude, have the third and see what happens and it you know for it just like the, they all of a sudden they would just be like hit the focus zone and they'd go do the race and they'd be like that was amazing and they were just like flying off the handle because they've never had that experience before so go okay look we found what you could do. And now we just have to like control it. We've got to contain it and do controlled attacks and controlled energy expenditure instead of being like, I'm a superhero and just go for it. And then realize that they're like, I'm in a little too much, <laughs> but I was a ha high caffeine operator. How did you sleep? Um, again, I guess a lot of the foundation is mindset, right? So big, big caffeine dose, like large energy expenditure. But then for me, post race is going through the mental process and um, going through yeah the process of going through your day, my day, going through the race and being happy with the outcome or processing the outcome, even if I like lost, understanding why I lost, making a plan of like how to avoid that again, you know, going through all those things so when I lay down. I've, I've processed my day and I've just slowed my mind down. And for me, that, that worked the most is like kind of closing the book on the day saying that I can't fix anything because it's already happened. I've made a plan and developed a strategy or an idea, what have you on how to rectify or continue success the next day. So there's nothing else for me to think about. So therefore I can go to bed and just slowly winding my mind down to not have anything to think about, even though I'm probably, you know, a little bit fired up that if you're like, Hey dude, let's go out. I would have the energy to go out. Right. But I've, I've started the process of turning my mind off, even though I do probably have energy. That's wild. I mean, you must, you, you, you obviously like have a high caffeine tolerance, but your caffeine metabolism must be very high as well, because I'm on the other side of the spectrum where I can, you know, I can drink a liter of coffee in the morning. I know it's unhealthy, but like, I have no problem <laughs> drinking a liter or more of 
black coffee. But if I have coffee after 12 p.m., it affects my sleep because the av- for the average person, the half-life of caffeine is about six hours, which means yep. if you have two, two espressos at 7 p.m., you know, by one o'clock in the morning, you've still got one of those espressos in your system. <laughs> so yep. you must have an extreme ability to not only, you know, tolerate the caffeine, but also metabolize it. That's pretty impressive, man. Four, four Red Bulls? At, yeah. And sometimes those crits are like at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., right? So, yeah, we had Athens at like 9 o'clock. Like there was a, definitely some late ones. But, yeah, I found that if I could, you know, just mentally wind down sooner than later and start that that calming process, like, you know, some meditation and, and be able to get into bed and have thought through most everything and not be wound up about what mistake I made or, you know, whatever, or understand, like, I thought about this enough. I'll think about it tomorrow and just giving my like setting right. those boundaries for my mind. Um, and that took like a long time to develop setting those boundaries and understanding that that was the healthy way to do it. You know, and it wasn't like, you know, telling myself that I'm not running away from anything by stopping to think about it and waiting for tomorrow. Um, mm. it, you know, but it takes therapy. <laughs> it takes meditation. It takes a lot of, um, you know, practice to get, to get to that point. Sp- speaking of Athens, did you win Athens? I've won it twice. I've won That's it right. uh, out of a field right. sprint and I've won it by lapping it, tw- lapping twice. Nice. Yeah. What was, yeah. what was so, better the field sprint or the breakaway? Um, the field sprint, I uh, like head to head against Ty Magner, hometown boy, um, right. you know, against the hen cappy powerhouse. Um, and so that was like, that was great. And then the next year winning at solo was, um, we lapped in one group with like 15 of us. And then in that moment, like the, when I attacked again, it was that moment it was like, I'm like, I don't feel that great. So nobody else must feel that great. And just put in an attack to just kind of see, test, like see where is everybody's at mentally, right? Because if the if they're not going to follow like mentally, they're like, Ooh, I don't know if that's a good idea and got the gap. And it was just like, this is happening. And then used, you know, everything of my mindset of like being arrow focusing on, you know, controlling my effort and all that stuff. And then it was gamesmanship because I was racing basically a Stellis, put their whole team on the front with oh, some, you know, people that I didn't necessarily get along with, you know, um, uh, so it became this like battle of like me versus this whole team. Right. And so that was like my mental motivator, which is like, there's no way these guys are going to get me. Like I'm going to mentally break every one of these guys. And I did. <laughs> awesome. um, and so, you know, I guess technically I didn't fully lap the second time because I didn't want to get into the field and deal with the mess. But, you know, I stayed like 10 seconds off the back of the group um, to kind of have that moment. And that was just like, special because it was just one of those things where it's like it was all mental more than physical uh for, where, for that whereas one. the but the bunch sprint is like power lifting like you come across yep. the line <laughs> with a, a roar a big flex yeah dude that yep. back to back to what you said early on in the podcast about each of your victories kind of having you know its own unique story of overcoming different things just hearing you talk a little bit about uh that scenario there with the team on the front and the personal stories behind it about uh, being the big motivator for you to, you know, push a little bit deeper and outcraft them, if you will. Um, and that's yep. a big part of it as well. You know, that, that, that whole <clears throat> application of fitness to the sport. I talk about that a lot with, with, with our athletes when they come into the program, I say, look, you know, one of the things we're really focused on at team EF coaching is not just like building fitness. Of course we can build fitness. We have the resources of a world tour pro cycling team like we can increase your fitness but to teach you how to apply that fitness is actually a lot harder and that's what we 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 really focus on and so you were obviously a rider who um was was talented like in order to win all the races you won and compete at the level you competed at you had to have some talent but you had to have some extreme ability to apply that talent to the sport of cycling and i think looking back and and the different races that I was in with you. That was something I I recognized about you early on as you had good, good rider craft and you were really good at kind of motivating the people around you to execute a plan. And I think that's what kind of makes you a little bit of a 
secret weapon as a coach as well as you can kind of get in there with your athletes and say, Hey, look, you know, this is your ability. This is who you are. This is what you need to do and how you need to motivate the people around you to get the result that you want to get. And I think that's a pretty unique ability when we look at like the Peloton today. Cause I mean, in the pro level, even in, in the U S everybody's strong, like everybody's yep. really strong, big FTPs, big, big numbers. Everybody's good. Right. But what separates the people from, you know, fifth place or eighth place and, and first, first, first place, right. It's, it's all these things you're talking about. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think for the majority, you know, of my like careers, like my FTP was like 340, 350, you know, and that's like, which is yeah, good, but it's good, but it's not like there's plenty of guys that if we rode side by side up a 6% grade, you know, and we, they would, they would just leave me in the dust or even on like a flat road, just, you know, we're going to, we're going to ride 400. And I was, you know, for sure in the first 25% to crack, right. <laughs> you know, and I have good enough numbers to get me in situations that I could take advantage of. Um, but that, I think that was also like part of my superpowers. When you don't have that absolute FTP, you have to figure out other ways. You have to learn and develop other ways to, to be successful. How do I use that guy with the 400 FTP or the 420 FTP to, to my advantage? But also yeah. how do I use the guy that has the 310, the 300 FTP? You know, how do I get that guy who is on my team to be successful and play a major part and keep that guy motivated and in, in, into the, into everything that we're doing, you know, and sometimes like, dude, you're going to get 75% of the way through this race. I know it, you know it, that's okay. And we're going to develop a plan that that 75% is a hundred percent impact, you know, right. and building those guys confidence and letting that guy use every ounce, every watt of that 300, you know, FTP, right. And say, Hey dude, this is how you got to maximize it. You got to like coast here, accelerate here, you know, don't panic. This is when you, all these little things and get guys through races and un unlocking that for them. I saw so many teammates, just have this like the light bulb go on and be like, Oh my God, I've been doing it wrong. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden it's just like people would see, you know, especially the later part of my career with the smaller teams, like with Texas Roadhouse or Athlete Octane, kind of these relatively no name riders, all of a sudden my team's at the front putting the herd on, you know, keeping, yeah, keeping I, position, I, I setting that. pace. And it's like, cause I've taught them how to ride the course, you know, I've taught them how to you, do the lead out to protect themselves and our team. You know, and that gives them confidence. All of a sudden, it's a, that they're winning the mind game to be like, I'm going to dig. I could go five more minutes. You know, I could go yeah. 30 more seconds. And all of a sudden, we're in the driver's seat of the mental battle because teams can't come around us and they go, these guys aren't that good. I know they're not that good, but I can't come around them. Why not? Well, right. dude, because we're using a different set of tools. <laughs> but, but you know, you know what? It's so true. And, 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 and why I'm so fascinated by that is because I lived that experience racing, I think against your team is so I have the same uh, disease as Colby. I've been a trainer since gosh, 2010. Right. So like when I walk through the grocery store, I'm like looking at everybody's posture and like, are their arches <laughs> collapsing and like, you know, how do they carry themselves? And so like, when I'd show up to the races, I, I remember like being in the Peloton and seeing like some, of course you had some good guys of like Danny Summerhill and such on your team where you look at, you're like, all right, that guy's an athlete. Right. Yep. But you had other guys and it's like, hmm, really, <laughs> <laughs> yep. you know, and, and, and they and you were able to get them to make an impact in the race. And so for me, that was, that was always, you know, kind of like something that was wrapped in my head around, like, you know, how are they doing this? You know, cause it, it, it's quite impressive that you're able to, you know, as you know, because as the leader on your team, as, the, as in, in, in criteriums, like the road captain is usually like the, the leader, the, the guy who's going for the win on the race, but you were typically the load, the road captain in the, in the crit teams. And like you said, you're able to get, you know, guys who didn't have as much raw strength, you know, you were able to get them to make a big impact for your team in the race. And I think that that skill set is what is a big difference maker for, especially in the amateur level and somebody being able to, you know, Fin just be happy to finish a race and somebody being able to compete for a top five or a win. And that's a big difference. So I, I I'm excited to see um, some of the results you get with some of your athletes this year. And, you know, because it, it, it's always amazing when you get any type of result, but it's even more fulfilling when you get a big result with an engine that was maybe not supposed to 
get that result. <laughs> yeah, that was me my whole career. <laughs> right. The engine that's not supposed to get the result. So, yeah, no, I'm, so, I'm, a, I'm so excited to just pass on and get stuck in, you know, with, with the athletes and, you know, pick up the nuggets and execute on them and, and learn them and build their toolbox, right? We're going from like a six pack of Crayola to like the mega 124 pack, right? Like, yeah, like how do we make this big piece of, piece of art, right? And have more colors to give it more depth. So, so talk to me a little bit about some of the, you mentioned that you were kind of like a bit of a tech nerd when you were, when you were getting into it and maybe Colby got you into that as well. Talk to me a little bit about some of the secrets that you found made a big difference in terms of technology in crit racing. For, so, I mean, it's like, right. We play the game of sponsorship, right. And you make, you make alliances and you're, you're sponsored by brands and you try to use their product to the highest level. Um, and we were fortunate being a small program that it's like we could go to, you know, handpick these brands and get them to say yes, you know, instead of it kind of being the other way around of just like, who's going to give us the most product and the most money and then kind of deal with it is we kind of went at the other way of just like, who are the ideal brands for, you know, what our team makeup is and convince them to, to partner with us. So right. we did have some, you know, luck there and with felt and Pearl Zumi um and and putting together a really hyper like aero package for uh you know the crits but then also left the door open that to use ceramic speed stuff right really get on the early train of reducing all friction as as much as possible again how do i maximize 340 watts <laughs> you know is re reduce friction um and then another big one that that played quite a big role was pan racer tires right like a, a really small company not as big as, you know, some of the other players, but building that relationship where then I can give feedback and have the product changed um, and be able to communicate well enough to be like, hey, this is, can we do this or can we do that and see those changes come? But then also learning that product, you know, that it's like, this is what the limitations or this is what that product is capable of, mm. right? And then operate within that window. If that makes, if that makes sense. My oh, wheels that... can only do this. So what are the limits and how do I, I kind of have to drive around what the tires are capable of or what the bike is capable of, et cetera. So that's a big thing that I don't think a lot of guys pay too much attention to. They just get stuck on equipment and go ride and they're like, oh, it is what it is. But if you don't understand what the limits are, whether that's like, you know, your tires probably have a little more than you think, right? And it's it definitely, you're either on the deck or you're not. <laughs> so it's up to you on how far you want to, you want to you want to test those but one thing i loved about that that felt is those engineers really developed that bike to move you know everybody's obsessed with stiffness it's got to be so stiff it's got to be so stiff but if you think about going around a corner that's not perfect and has bumps and your bike is fully rigid you know it's a piece of wood it's just going to hop and skip and bounce and throw you all over the place but if your fork is able to flex front to back you know a little bit you know, and if your chain stays flex a little bit, right now, your bike is part of that suspension package, right now, it's able to get stuck on the ground, right? That's why bigger tires are becoming faster, right? Because they don't <laughs> bounce off the ground, they stay and give you traction. Um, That's so, a problem with the Chinese bikes, man, like they don't, they don't put the different layers of carbon. <laughs> and I, I don't mean like all Chinese bikes, like a lot of yeah. great bikes are made in high quality factories in China. But a lot of the knockoffs, like the fake Pinarellos and Colnagos and stuff, is they're not they're not constructed with all the different types of carbon fiber in different areas of the frame to be able to be rigid where they want it to be rigid and soft and supple where yeah. it needs to be. Yeah, so it's just learning to drive the bike you're on to understand that what it's going to do when it hit bumps. Is it going to chatter? Is it not? And and just yeah, just learn the system, right? It's just right. you know to go down the cliche of like formula one it's like Danny Ricardo couldn't drive a certain car with his technique. Right? right. And then you have other guys that can drive any car because they learn the system. They learn what it's going to do, how it's going to react. So it's, right. it's the same, same thing. You're not going to drive a F-150 the same as you are a 911. Right. Yeah, but you got to figure yeah. out how it drives. You know, what's interesting about that, this, this whole conversation on tech so far is like, there's a lot of sponsored information out there that it doesn't, it doesn't come out as being sponsored. Nobody says, Hey, this is a sponsored post for this brand. And this is why I'm telling you that it's great. Right. Yep. And so 
the the issue is that most people, unfortunately, most people won't actually learn to ride their equipment to the limit or test their equipment to the limit. I always, I always say that to myself. I'm like, okay, like, why am I a good person to test equipment? Well, I go around corners at 80k an hour. I can ride, you know, pretty high, you know, wattage output. I like to race. I like to do accelerations. I want to spread. I want to take everything to the limit, right? Like, just go out and ride, man. You know. But you yep. see most people out there, Daniel, and they're like really just cruising along. A lot of people out there are just cruising <laughs> along out for a bike ride on that, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar bike. And there's nothing wrong with that. But those are the people who are online, like, okay, what is the best tire? Right. And they yep. get that review from somebody who's just trying to sell them a tire. And so for me, like anytime I ever think about like giving buddy anybody recommendation on what type of equipment to get, I'm always like, okay, like what kind of rider are you? Because if yep. you're if you if you're somebody who like wants to fly around corners and like really lean that bike going down hills, like you need good tires, right? You're yep. not necessarily so concerned about getting the odd flat, like you want to grip, you know. Yep. So a lot a lot of it that actually I think comes down to you know misinformation, and then as you progress, being able to identify what information is actually relative to you. Like I saw a great review. Do you know who Alex Richardson is? I don't. So he was, um, he's like an investment banker. He's kind of known as like the guy who has it all and doesn't need to do bike racing, but <laughs> loves to bike race more than anything. And so he raced at the world tour level, um, retired from being an investment banker to race world tour. And now he races at like the continental level. But I just saw a review that he did on a, on a popular bike brand. And he's like, look, I'm not sponsored to do this brand, but I ride a 420 watt FTP. I smash group rides every single day. And I want to give you guys <laughs> honest feedback of why this thing is good or not. And just like broke it down from like a perspective that like I could really relate to. I was like, oh, dude, I want to get that bike. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so much about use case, right? And yeah. again, you can go back to the car analogy. It's like, yeah, you just need something to drive around town, be durable. You don't have to think about it. It's always going to work. Or... Do you want something that's high performance and fast? And But to make sure that it's always high performance and fast, you have to have maintenance. You always have to look after it. You have to pay attention to it. And it's the fine line of like with tires nowadays, right? Everybody's telling you, it's like, oh, this is five watts. This is three watts. This is eight watts. Whatever, it's faster, yes. faster, faster. But it's like, I don't know. Right now with where I'm at in life, is like, I don't want to have to look at my tires every day. You know, like that 10 mm -hmm. watts is not worth me like, getting an hour away from my house and flatting and dealing with all of that. Absolutely. I'd rather just know that I can go ride and not mm -hmm. have a problem. And it's 10 Watts. And I think we're really, you know, just getting into that, like people just trying to, you know, it is a bit of sales, right? It's like your marketing, but I've also found out through just experience, right? Having access testing is people like release an arrow Jersey, but they don't tell you how to wear it to maximize how fast it is. Oh, good point. Right. So like nowadays, all and you could see for the most part, like right? of course, because it's a world tour and everybody's like maximized, is they're all wearing the jersey the same way. And you can see that the seams fall all in the same spot for everybody. And that's for mm -hmm. a reason. You know, if you just throw that jersey on yourself and the seam's not where it's supposed to be, you know, you're not getting what it was developed to get. You know, so if you could look look back at like old photos of me and Pearl Zumi stuff, is like a lot of our stuff is fit and worn a certain way because if that seam on the bicep isn't where it's supposed to be it's not doing anything <laughs> it's not giving mm -hmm. me you know the 40 hours of testing that they did you know hundreds of hours of testing they did the fabric choices they made you know the the size of clothing that i chose if the seam's not where it's supposed to be i'm not getting those 15 or 20 watts that some clothing can give you right so it's people, if you're going to like buy into the wattage, if you're going to buy into the gains, marginal gains, you have to like educate yourself on how to use it. And everybody l locally is like, I got the fast bike. And it's like, well, that's hanging out in the wind and that's hanging out in the wind. And but your, your body's a sail. Covered. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's about, if you're going to pick arrow helmets, if you're going to pick arrow clothing and you want to maximize it, mentally be prepared to have the discipline to use it how it's to be maximized, and, but also and, and you can just enjoy it with the being a sail head in the wind. I mean, that's 80% of my riding is just head in the wind, just enjoy it. Get out of here, dude. <laughs> Get out of here. So just, just to clarify, 
what Daniel is talking about in regards to the stitching is companies will, will put seams in specific places to make arrow traps. So these changes in elevation in the fabric are designed to, um, help you move faster through the air. And if you don't have them, have them placed in the right spot on your body, they're not going to be as effective. So that's what Daniel is talking about when he's talking about having the seam in the right place on his bicep. Yeah. And so when you go out and buy arrow clothing or you're shopping for it, right, you're talking to the salespeople, like ask if they know, right. Or if they don't like do your research to figure out how some clothing is, is supposed to be worn. Cause there is like this mid-level that's just has no seams, right. And that can just be pretty much put on. And also like a trap that a lot of people fall for them being arrow is buying something that's a size too small because it fits right. tight. Um, but that, we we found out in Pearl Zooming that that's not always the case to having the f absolute tightest thing wasn't always the, f the fastest. So, you know, make sure don't fall into that trap of like just having the tightest thing thinking it's the fastest because it may open up the fabric and ruin that or you just also may be cutting off like circulation, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and like that just sub fascia and just all of a sudden you're like wondering why you're aching after like 90 minutes is because like you are cutting off some amount of blood flow and when when it needs to flow it needs to flow you can't have any yeah. any, any yeah. cutoff for it um so that's a big thing is just find that clothing you like and get the right size and you know if it's got seams or trip lines or you know what have you learn where those goes to maximize you know that 200 hundred dollar jersey how it's supposed to be worn but you know what's interesting about the the kit side of things is i was uh looking at some cda files with Andreas Clear from from our team who does a lot of the aero testing with with Peter Shep on our guys in the wind tunnel and you know like everybody sees this I, and I won't release the exact numbers on air but everybody sees the you know the big POC aero helmet as like the most you know aerodynamic helmet out there but I have in the, in the background here if you're watching the, the video I have the Cerebral from POC which is the very small one and it's only 0 0.0 one faster in the wind tunnel than the big one right but the big uh the big pock helmet if you change your head position at all it becomes a becomes a sail and so yeah. the the point is that the most important thing above and beyond like aero helmets and clothing and all this tech is how you position yourself on your bike is actually the most important part of like the aerodynamic game. I'm glad we got into this a little bit because <laughs> it's quite an interesting conversation, but Colby Pierce puts it quite eloquently. He says, he always says con contortionism is a massive part of being able to not only ride super efficient positions, but then be able to generate force in those positions. And so I think the tech side of things is, is amazing. I'm a huge tech nerd myself i want to have the the fastest stuff we all do right but learning how to ride those positions that maximize the benefits of the equipment is probably more important in in the long run but what about like tire pressure i know it's a big one for the crits like how much tire pressure would you recommend for crits and does it change that much from a dry day to a wet day how did you go about tire pressure yeah, I mean, so again, like kind of with the nutrition aspect, tires have changed dramatically in the last three years, right? I think when, you know, the last big crits I was on, we were like 26s, you know, and that was like the big tires. You know, we were still on the Panerish like 25 mil tubulars um, mm. versus tubulars. now a lot of guys are running like 30s, you know, 32s. Um, dude, Michael yeah. Valkren got me on thirties this year. <laughs> dude, yeah. dude, I was battling with him. He's like, dude, just try them. We were at Stroud Bianchi and he's like, try these, <laughs> try these thirties. I put them on him. Like, you're not wrong. You're not wrong, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it's one of those, it's again, it's one of those things that's particular to you, right? Like I'm right now, 175 pounds. Another guy that's 175 pounds. We, you need to be like in an operating window, right? Of probably five PSI. But it's also like what you like, what you feel, the feel that you like. In 5 PSI, like we're talking about going down the rabbit hole of CRR, like rolling resistance, right? Like you're just within a small window of like what's faster. So it then becomes mm -hmm. what's feel. Because at the end of the day, if I can go through that final corner 3K an hour faster than the guy that has 0.001 better CRR because optimal tire pressure, 
Right. I'm winning. Like that's it's yes, not hundred percent. We are like the, the gap of optimal is not big enough in most instances, right? Um, it's again, putting that whole package together. So it's finding that, you know, what, are, like, what's the optimal operation window that we say, okay, this size tire for your weight is between 70 and 80 PSI. So go out and ride 70 or ride 72, 74, 76, 78 on roads, you know, corners, you know, and say, what do I like best? And then in that t 10 PSI window, again, like it's all going to be like, quote, optimized. Because again, if you feel good on your equipment and you feel confident in your equipment, that's going to make up more than whatever that like percentage of rolling resistance, give or take that you're like trying to find. And so for me, like I, again, 25 mil tubes, um, massive, like tubeless didn't, wasn't quite there yet. Um, at the end of my career, I loved, I mean, I was just like old school tubular boy. I just like, just loved all of it. I loved the fact that my tire was going to stay on my wheel no matter what <laughs> in any mm. inc instances. Um, yeah. And so that, that was like, that was part of the comfort peace of mind that, you know, even through a corner, I'd get a flat. I'm not losing rubber. I'm not going to hit carbon and then just full slide. I may have right. a chance, you know, like I'm giving myself a chance uh, with rubber stain on the wheel. Um, and then I probably operated those anywhere from like 80 to 94 ish um, in the dry, depending on the course. And then they would go into the, like the mid mid seventies for the rain. You know, you know, what's crazy is you're, you're not wrong about tubulars, <laughs> like back even just a few years ago, like tubulars actually being the better option. I did a podcast with the, the, I mean, he's the guy that creates all the high end tires at Victoria. So he's yep. the chief product designer and the, the, the podcast itself wasn't that entertaining because we're talking about like developing tires and it's kind of technical. We haven't put it out yet. It may still come out. I don't know. I'm not in charge of that. But <laughs> what he basically explained to me was that the previous generations of tires, so they just came out with this all new Vittoria Pro, which by the way, dude, you got to try. It's, it's game changing tire. But <laughs> all of the other previous in existence, clincher and tubeless tires weren't as round as tubulars. So they've been yep. trying to, you know, get the same shape as this tubular tire, but they just haven't been able to do it. And the Victoria Pro is the only tire in existence that they've been able to get the same shape as a tubular. So it feels like and rides like a tubular, but you can ride it as a clincher with a latex tube inside of it if you want to go really fast or tubeless as well. We ride tubeless on the team, but that's a badass tire, I do have to say. Yeah. And I mean, we can go down the rabbit hole of like tires and where they're at, right? Because it's like part of why teams don't pick tubulars is because they are that round shape and it's not the most aerodynamic, you know? And so some tires are chosen, clinchers are chosen because they're actually a more aero better, more, uh, they're getting a better performance gain in the aero from that tire shape rather than the benefit they're getting from the rolling resistance, right? And so it's just like, this is like in the weeds. This is what like the world tour teams are like, they have a guy full time fig figuring out <laughs> for me, even racing. Like if I went to back to racing crits full time, like I don't know how much energy I would spend on it to, to be honest. I'd be like, what's going to be, you know, fast and stay on my rim. Those are two, yeah. <laughs> those are my two priorities. Stay on the rim is probably first. And what's the fastest wheel that's going to tire that's going to stay on my, stay on my rim. And then I'll probably just close the door on that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down. As, as deep as the world tour teams are going tire shapes and then rolling resistance and everything else. Oh, the, the amount of testing we do at the team is, is pretty intense, right? From, you know, not only like rolling resistance tests, but wind tunnel tests, like you mentioned, and all of these different factors that go into, you know, the piece of equipment that, that makes it. And the, the cool thing about Victoria, right. Is like, they are, you know, now working with, I remember like when Victoria first started, the tires weren't, great they were actually like some of the sketchier tires <laughs> out there but the thing is like when you're working with teams like jumbo and uae and of course ef like you they're just the, these guys are not gonna ride bad quality stuff like you're not gonna put a five million dollar a year podge car on a on a sketchy tire right like you yep. just wouldn't do that <laughs> so it's yep it's the last I'm excited for you to actually try these Victoria pros and get back to me on it and tell me I'm either crazy or you love them. Cause I think that would be interesting feedback. We, uh, 
we we got to definitely get you back on the show. Hey, one question, Danny, how old yep. are you now? Oh, what do you think? How do I look? How do I look? 25. <laughs> oh, <laughs> beauty. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm 36 now. Oh, dude, you can race masters. Yeah, I just discovered that that there's um in, at least in the US like track nationals. I could go do masters track nets. I'm not it's going to be 40 plus on the road in the US. Um but- but, is where the category but we starts. Can, but. We can also go as like Team EF coaching Grand Fondo team to World Masters Championships next year. Oh, I'm here for it. Let's, Let's go. go, dude. <laughs> we, we got, gravel we got, gravel we Worlds got, this year. What's what's the gravel? What's the gravel Masters? Is that 35 plus? I don't know if yeah, I stand a chance there, but <laughs> I mean, you need a couple weeks of training, you'd be all right. <laughs> yeah, be all right. If you in there, well, I'm here for that it. was awesome. That was awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We definitely got to get you back on the show. We got plenty to talk about with you. I'm super excited to have you on the on the coaching team. I think we're going to do some awesome work together. Well, that was an action-packed hour of content. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the Team EF Coaching Performance Podcast. We're excited to have you on the team of coaches here in the program. And thank you to all of the listeners who tuned into this episode. We hope that you picked up some golden nuggets that you can apply to your cycling. I'm Zach Morris, and until next time, take care, everyone.